Hello, everyone. Welcome to the app modernization demonstration. Uh, my name is Hank Scorpio. I work for the Globex Corporation. I'm glad you could join me today. We are a global conglomerate. We have a retail business that is one of our key businesses to our overall strategy as a company. And I want to tell you a little bit about the history of one of the applications inside of our retail business. Um, there's been a group of folks that have been knocking on my door, emailing me uh, from the conveyor community that wanted to hear about this and kind of our history of our retail application and where we are today. So I'm excited to, to invite them into the, the room here and into the meeting and, and tell them the history of this and see what they can do to help me modernize this application. Uh, so this retail application is a typical N-tier application. It started in the mid 2000s. It's a monolith. Uh, it runs on VMs on uh, today on VMware vSphere. Uh, we've got a number of challenges with this. Um, uh, our code commits take a very long time. We had a code deployment that brought down the entire system once. When things fail, it often takes us hours to fix them. It's leading to long downtime. And during peak times, we have trouble handling transaction volume. So if you're familiar with the DevOps metrics that you want to measure, we're failing in all of them uh, with, this, uh, with this application in the mid-2000s. And so uh, we decided to begin to strangle this monolith. There's four services we identified, the gateway service, the customer service, the order service, and the inventory service inside of this application. And so what we did is we began to strangle them. And at the time, uh, we heard of this platform called Cloud Foundry. And so we decided to uh, basically strangle out the gateway and order service and develop a new modern front end uh, that would make our application uh, more customer friendly um, as well. And we did this all in Cloud Foundry. We did it using Spring Boot. Unfortunately, we realized that Cloud Foundry is not the best choice of platform, given the momentum, uh, momentum that Kubernetes has in the ecosystem. So we now, you know, we started to realize that we didn't want to develop any more applications on Cloud Foundry. And we also started to uh, discover new runtimes like Quarkus that were even more efficient than Spring Boot uh, for cloud native application development. So what we did next was we took this inventory service and we split it out into a Kubernetes environment. The nice thing here is that we could actually bring our database uh, on Kubernetes because Kubernetes could handle persistence. We developed the inventory service uh, using uh, Quarkus um, and, uh, the, and we, were, you know, we thought we were moving in the right direction. Unfortunately, the big challenge we have with our Kubernetes environment is that we've manually deployed uh, this inventory service. Our development teams kind of have just developed it and, and have a manual way of deploying it. And in order for us to promote this into our production Kubernetes clusters, we're going to have to uh, replatform it. We're going to have to automate the way we do this. Uh, they're really trying to embrace a, a GitOps method for uh, our development. And so they don't want to just have manual deployments. They want to be able to redeploy in an automated fashion. So this is where we are today. It's uh, really challenging. Um, our customer service still remains on VMs. It's slowing our deployment frequency. So we still can't deploy uh, any faster than we used to because our customer service is really lagging behind in the ability to deploy faster. Um, our services on Cloud Foundry need a path forward, and we need to move them to a platform that has a strong and reliable future. And our inventory service needs to be automated so that we can deploy it into our, our production Kubernetes environments in the future. Um, and most of all, there, you know, perhaps is that we're maintaining three platforms, and this becomes really difficult. Uh, you see one of our employees there who's having a tough time uh, managing all three platforms at once. So I've invited uh, the conveyor team here because ultimately what I want to get to is this. I want all of my services running on Kubernetes um, so that I get the benefits of it, horizontal scaling, automated rollout and rollback, bin packing, all those great things that Kubernetes gives me. I want to leverage a GitOps model to decrease my lead time for change, uh, mean time to recover and change failure rate, and increase my deployment frequency. And I want to simplify my operations by putting all of this on a single platform that's easier to manage uh, for my ops teams. Um, and then I can start to plug in cloud services and all these other things uh, and, and do even you know, more fancy cloud native things in the future with this application to increase its value. Um, so I've invited the conveyor team here. This is my current retail application. Uh, Ramon, you were telling me uh, how you guys can help me uh, start to modernize this app. Can you can you tell me more? Yeah, of course. So uh, first of all, I think we need to run an assessment on all the different services uh, within your application. And it looks like this legacy customers component will be a bit problematic. So I think we should run an analysis on that one to try to find out what could prevent it from running on containers. And once we have found out everything, start with the refactoring of the uh, application to adapt it to a more cloud-friendly uh, architecture. Nice, nice, that's great. So once we do that, um, what am I gonna do with this database though? Miguel, well, you were telling the me database, something. Yeah, uh, 
I mean, there are some workloads that are not intended to be migrated straight ahead and that uh, the modernization could take longer, but you could bring them to Kubernetes uh, either way by moving them as virtual machines. So you just take the database in the virtual machine as it is. So you just deploy it as a virtual machine on the target, and then you could leverage all the all the features that Kubernetes provides for virtual machines because they are just another Kubernetes object. Oh, You'll see that it blends. It will blend a lot better in your CI/CD uh, pipelines and in your in your GitOps. Thanks, thanks, Miguel. Yeah, that's good because I'm scared to do anything with that uh, database. Uh, it scares me to death uh, to touch it. It's very old. Um, what about my Cloud Foundry uh, apps? Yeah, uh, so you can uh, take all your Cloud Foundry apps and use the conveyor MutuCube to uh, analyze the code and create the right artifacts for deploying it into Kubernetes, um, including your CACD pipelines. Everything will be modernized with MutuCube. Oh, wow. All right. Thanks, Ashok. And finally, my, my inventory service. What am I going to do here? So for that, we'll use the Crane project, which will help you remove everything that was art coded in your deployment. And uh, so we'll clean this up, push that to Git, and get this fully automated so that you can really deploy this app and promote it from dev to QE to production in an automated fashion. Thanks, Marco. So we've got assess, analyze, refactor, rehost, replatform, all these things onto Kubernetes. I'll tell you what, I, I, I want to believe you all, but it sounds too good to be true. I think I need to see it. Uh, to believe it. So maybe we can get started. OK, definitely. So uh, allow me to start with the assessment of your portfolio with uh, Tackle. So let me share you my screen and pray to the Fedora gods that this works. It seems to be working. Right. Okay, so the entry point for the Tackle tool is the application inventory. And what we will intend to do with the application inventory is offer organizations a way to uh, manage their, their application portfolio and have a holistic view of this uh, application portfolio. So it looks like your uh, architects were proactive enough to load up the your portfolio within the application inventory so we can get started here. Uh, one of the cool things about the inventory is that it allows you to classify and manage your portfolio in any way you might want. Uh, first of all, we have the notion of business service. So right now we have all, all your different business services on, on screen, but we wanted to focus on, on your retail applications so we can filter uh, the retail applications just like this. And talking about managing the portfolio and classifying the, the, the applications, uh, one of the most exciting features in the application inventory is an extensible uh, tagging model that allows you to classify your portfolio in as many dimensions as you might want. So, for example, focusing on this legacy customer management application we were discussing before, if we expand, we can see a series of tags in here. Uh, for the moment, we, we have used the tags uh, with the concept of technologies that each application has. So we have Java, Tomcat, Oracle. As I said, the tagging model is extensible. So we added uh, another uh, tag type related to the different uh, custom frameworks you might be using within your application. So it seems like this legacy customer management application is using a custom configuration library. And I mm. get the feeling that this might be the problem that we need to solve you know, to, to make this application suitable for containers. Yeah, no, that's great. It'd be great to look into that custom configuration and figure out more, learn more about it. OK, so let's start the assessment so we can select the application and get in straight away into the assessment. We already filled out the assessment beforehand. I know you are a very uh, busy person, Mr. Scorpio, so it, I promise this will be fast. Great, great. So if we continue, the first thing that we are presented is the list of stakeholders that have been involved in the assessment. There's this Homer Simpson guy in here. I, I think you might be familiar with him. Yeah, yeah. He was very involved in this application. OK, so moving on. Uh, well, the, the way we see the assessment is a questioner-driven assessment. So we, we are presented with a series of questions of different aspects related to the application landscape. And by that, I mean technology, application lifecycle management, architecture, all the different concerns that might have an impact on, on, on the application. And the idea behind the assessment is to find out how suitable the application is for, for containers. 
Okay, so this gives me kind of a, a, a general idea of what might be challenges that I might have in containerizing the customer service app. Exactly. Out now, of this, the, this would have been really uh, helpful with the rest of our services we strangled out. So it's good we have it now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, happy to be here to help. So yeah, what, what the tool does is based on your answers, it detects a series of potential risks that might prevent the application or present some sort of threat for the application to, to run on, on containers. So let's let's skip the the assessment and go straight into the review to find out what uh, what these risks are. So I can save and start with the review process. And here we have a, a high level diagram of the different risks that have been identified out of my uh, of my answers. But we can get down to the detail. Yeah, we should check out that high and medium. I'm, I'm guessing, yeah. Absolutely. So we have the list of risk identified. If I reorder this thing, I get the high and mediums presented first. So there seems to be some problem with uh, the way your application handles service discovery. And that makes sense because it, it, it comes from a legacy platform in which uh, uh, static IPs and things like that are used. And that is not very cloud friendly. Mm. So that's, that's one yeah. thing. Uh, the other risk that has been identified is the, the maturity level in your organization related to containerization process. But I guess that's why we're here. Yeah, absolutely. And finally, we have detected that you have some 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 trouble with how the application is, is being configured. So there seems to be multiple configuration files in multiple file system locations. And that is an anti-pattern when you're talking about cloud-native cloud and cloud-friendly applications. Yeah, I seem to recall some developers had, had been loading configs from local file systems. So that, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So it seems like this custom library that we already detected has some sort of responsibility here. And we need to figure out what to do with that, maybe replace it with a more straightforward approach or something like that. So once we have identified the different risks, we, we have enough information to make a, an informed decision on what would be the, the best migration strategy for this application. So if we go up, we're presented with a six R's uh, or, 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 or the six R's for, for Amazon, the, st the standard for the different migration strategies to follow. In this case, we will choose refactor since we need to perform some changes in the source code for the application to be uh, more container ready and, and, and cloud friendly, cloud native. I think removing the, the library is a small uh, effort It's if it's just about that, but there seems to be no other risk in, in, the, in the assessment. I know this, this application is very critical for you, and I think it should be our top priority uh, yeah, to agreed. follow. So we can submit the, the review, and everything gets stored for, for later consumption. So now, uh, we have this uh, this assessment. We have some sort of clues of what needs to be addressed here. The next step will be to do an analysis and being able to detect on the actual source code what are the things that are preventing us from from doing a clean migration towards uh, okay. towards cloud. So we're so, kind of going uh, we're going from kind of a high level disposition down into let's let, let's figure out what we need to actually change. Yeah. Exactly. That's okay. that's that's the idea behind this. So uh, we have an analysis uh, piece for Tackle on development right now. We're bringing uh, some other project into the Tackle umbrella. So for the moment, we will have to switch to another tool. Uh, mm, okay. In the future, we want to have everything fully integrated in the same fashion like we have the assessment. So we click on application and click on assess. Well, it will be the same with the analysis. So for the moment, we need to switch to another application. And, mm. and this is the, the analysis bit of it. The first step is to choose what is the migration path we want to follow. So I'm guessing you still want to keep the Tomcat uh, runtime that you have right now for the application? Yeah, yeah. I'll leave it like it is for now, I think, just to move forward quickly. OK, so no need to choose an application server. Uh, we need to do a containerization process, of course. I will for I will do a sanity check with the Linux migration path just to make sure there are no Windows static paths in there from other versions of the application. And I I know you you have some problems with the licensing with the Oracle JDK and you will want to get rid of that. Yeah, that would be great if while we're moving we could move to Open JDK. It'd be wonderful. So we choose that that migration path as well. So we have containerization, Linux, and Open JDK. So maybe maybe, maybe in the future we could actually use that Quarkus bit with our Spring Boot apps as well for for from Cloud Foundry. Absolutely. Okay. If you want to do this 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 uh, modernization step, I think you, you you already have used this somehow for these Quarkus applications you already have. So yeah, maybe your architects are somehow familiar with this. 
Yeah. So uh, moving on, once we have selected the, the migration path we want to follow, then it's time to select which are the packages that we want to analyze. So uh, we remove everything. We want to focus just on the business classes from your application and, and avoid the libraries. So we will choose this conveyor packaging. It's funny because you use the same packaging that we do. So it kind of feels like this is some sort of staged marketing demo, but it isn't. No, absolutely. The buildings behind me are real. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like that. So uh, once we have selected the, the business packages we want to analyze, we move on. Next step is the custom rule. So we, we've been discussing these, uh, this custom configuration library. So we already had some conversations with your architects, and they already told us about this library. So we know how to find it within your code, and we already came up with, with some strategy to replace it with a more straightforward, standard approach to enable externalized configuration in Kubernetes. Mm, so like something like config maps or things like that. Exactly, being able to yeah. use config maps and, and secrets. So we need to sort this thing out within the source code itself to enable that possibility. So okay. in order to detect this, this, the usage of this library in your source code, we have come up with a custom rule for, for the analysis bit. So I will upload the custom rule we developed jointly with your architects. So this analysis component is a, a rules engine that is extensible. So we came up with another extended uh, rule and we added to the rule set for the, for the analysis. So we, we upload it, we enable the rule, and then we're good to go with the analysis. Oh, great, okay. Moving on, we won't be using any custom labels. We also have a gazillion of uh, options to fine tune, to further fine tune the analysis, but for the moment we will stick with the with the target. Okay. So moving on, and last step is to review that we didn't make any mistakes, uh, which we didn't. So we're good to go and start the the analysis. Hmm. Okay. So this is going to open so, up that that application archive, look for any of those patterns that match, and then highlight them for me. Yeah. Exactly. That's that's exactly what is that it does. It's some sort of static analysis uh, using the binaries, decompiling, and then analyzing the source code. So since we are a bit a bit tight in in time, air VC person, I already run the analysis beforehand, so I have the results here. This. These are the reports that are produced by the analysis. So we choose our application. Then the most interesting part of the analysis is the list of issues that have been detected. And by issues, we mean the things that are preventing your application to run on the target platform, which in this case is Kubernetes. Mm, OK. I see the legacy configuration, the hard-coded IPs, and the file system, and it caught all three of the, all those, yeah? Yeah, that's it, exactly. So uh, this legacy configuration, that's an occurrence of the custom rule we developed. So it presents us the number of incidents within each one of the classes of your application and provides a series of hints and, and links to documentation on how to actually uh, uh, fix this, this, this issue. So if we click on the class itself, we can navigate straight into your source code and see where the the offending lines are have been detected on 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 the analysis and that mm. that that this could be pretty useful to work with the changes but we're working on a on a web console here so we cannot actually do the changes yeah so how do my developers then actually go through and change this make this change can we refactor it uh yes yeah, so uh, one thing could be keep changing from, from this window to your ID, but that's, that doesn't feel very productive to us. So that's why we developed a series of IDE uh, plugins for the most popular IDEs out there. So my ID of choice is, of choice is VS Code, and I already have the project open in, in VS Code. I already installed the, 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 the plugin. So uh, once I have my project open, I can go into the, the plugin view and do the configuration of another analysis. So I chose the exact same target uh, migration target, which is Cloud mm. Readiness, Linux, Open JDK. I also use the, the the custom roles. And once we are done with this, I can click here. I can click here and run, and the analysis will run, and we will get the, the the results. So I already did that. I have the results in here, so we can access the exact same report that we have on the on the web console. 
to be consumed locally. But again, we, we, we agreed that this is not the most practical approach to follow. So we also mm. have a list of issues that have been detected on the on the application. So if we navigate towards this persistent config uh, class and open it, there seems to be two hints. If I click on here, I can see what the offending lines are. If I need any more detail, I can hover here and see the description or I can see the details. So I can basically get the, the need details on what needs to be changed and the actual source code side by side and start performing the changes, which will be uh, pretty pretty straightforward and, and easy. So mm. after doing this, after doing all these changes, my application will, will be ready to be deployed in containers, but we, we need to go to the next level. Once we have our, our source code ready to be in containers, we definitely need to generate all the different uh, manifests and images images for this application to run in Kubernetes. And that is something that moved to Cube uh, does. So we have uh, my colleague Ashok here that will show you how this thing works. Oh, wow, that's great. Thanks, thanks, Ramon. So basically, we've taken me through kind of assessing my entire application portfolio, then analyzing the customer app, then understanding what needs to be changed in it, making those changes. And now you're saying that um, we could use a tool called move to cube inside a conveyor to actually generate all the objects and manifests and things I need to deploy on Kubernetes. Is that right? That's it. Okay, cool. So, so Ashok, uh, you're, uh, from what I understood, you, you're going to focus on the cloud foundry pieces, but this could just as well move to cube could be just as well used to, to create the manifests and objects for the customers or customers, uh, service. Is that right? Absolutely, James. Uh, so uh, as long as you have you have your source code or runtime information, Motocube can use that to create your destination artifacts. Wow, that's great. That's great. Okay, so let's talk about my my Spring Boot apps running on Cloud Foundry. How am I going to move those over? Absolutely. So uh, you have uh, a couple of uh, Spring Boot apps, the gateway service and the order services, and uh, Node.js application, uh, the front end. Let's look at them and uh, see how we can uh, translate them. Right. So. Um, so let's uh, have a quick demo of Motocube with the UI. Um, Akash, if you can share your screen. Sure. Okay. So the first thing that we are going to do for Motocube is to um, look at the source code, right? Uh, so here is a, a source code of Motocube. We have the uh, E2E demo apps. So let's look at what we have there. So if you look at the uh, code there, uh, you have the uh, pattern try React Seed, which is the front-end app. And then you have your uh, back-end applications uh, in the RH OAR microservices demo. You have your orders and the gateway uh, uh, services. So what we are going to do now is to uh, take a zip of this folder. We have uh, already zipped it in E2E demo apps.zip. And we are going to give it to Motocube to do the translation. So let's head over to the Motocube UI. So this is the Motocube UI. Um, what we are going to first do is to create a project to call demo. And then we are going to head over to that project. And the first thing we need to do is to upload the source code. So mm -hmm. we upload the zip file. Gotcha. So that's the source for my gateway and orders app and everything, actually, but gateway and orders too, yeah? Absolutely, yes. OK, great. The the second thing that we will be uploading is the configuration. So there are some environment uh, information like your ingress and other information. We need to give it to Motocube so that it can create the exact right artifact. So we are uh, uploading the configuration to Motocube, and you can see both of them uh, there in the UI. The next step that we will do is to do the processing. Uh, here, what it will do is it will go through all the files and use the configuration, try to understand what are the services that. So to save time, we have uh, done a pre-processing of this uh, in another project. So let's just head over to that. Okay. okay. So now uh, you can see that um, uh, the your plan file has been created, which has information on your uh, different services and um, the di different folders in, in which it found it. What are the configuration information about your applications? The next step that we will do is to use this information to do that uh, transformation. Mm -hmm. So let's try that out. For that, let's click on Start Transformation. And then uh, it uses the information in the plan file, the source code, the configs that we gave, and uh, it will do the translation and give you the data. Ah, OK, so uh, it's going to give me my artifacts that I need. Exactly. 
Okay. Um, so you can see that uh, the transforming is done. Um, that is, um, let's download the artifacts and see what is that. So it will uh, give it, give us a zip file. Let's just uh, unzip that file and see um, the artifacts Motocube has created for us. So we are going to open the um, unzipped file in VS Code to look into the contents. So if you open the um, uh, CF2 uh, OCP folder, um, you have a source folder, which is your uh, initial source that we uploaded, and um, into which it has seeded some more files. Let's look at what it has added to it. It has added the uh, Docker okay. files to each of your services. Oh, great. So it created the Docker files in, for how to generate those services, yeah? Exactly. So you can create your uh, Docker images out of it um, using these Docker files. Hmm. And um, then what it has also created is uh, it has created some scripts which help you test locally. Uh, we have already used these scripts to build your images and push your images to registry. And um, the next step would be to deploy. OK. And under deploy is all my, my artifacts necessary to deploy on top of Kubernetes. Exactly. So you can see your ingress, your deployment, the service, and uh, <laughs> um, all the YAMLs that you need to deploy um, for all your services. Wow, yeah, that would save me a bunch of time. I mean, I would have to go do these all manually by hand for everything running on Cloud Foundry, yeah? Exactly. And also, if you look at the uh, YAML's parameterized folder, it has uh, a bunch of additional uh, uh, Helm charts, customized YAML's, and OpenShift templates of these files. So if you prefer to use any of them, you can use that. Cool. cool. Now, let's uh, deploy uh, this app into K Kubernetes. So let's head over to our terminal, and let's check whether we are connected to the uh, cluster by using kubectl version. So we are connected to uh, the Kubernetes cluster. And then uh, what we will uh, do is uh, we will uh, now uh, push the uh, YAMLs. Hmm. To do that, we will just do a kubectl apply. And we will uh, give the YAMLs folder that we had. Gotcha. So now you're just applying the YAML that was created by Move to Cube, and this should deploy deploy our Cloud Foundry apps right on Kubernetes. Is that right? That is correct. So we are we have already built the images, pushed the images, and now uh, we have deployed all your services. It is creating all the deployment servers and uh, ingress. Now uh, let's look at whether all the ports are up, and uh, then we can see our app running. So now that yeah, we can see all the running, huh? Yeah, all the ports are up. Now let's get the ingress and check with the UI. So we have the ingress. Now let's just check the uh, ingress in the UI. So let's hit here. And we are able to uh, check, uh, have your front end app running with uh, connections to your back end. Wow, that's awesome. That that. It's amazing. That really that automation really helps make things go a lot faster uh, to be able to redeploy everything. Yeah. Now you are able to see um, locally, right? Um, but you want, might want to uh, automate your CI/CD pipelines. So, uh, if you notice, you have the CI/CD artifacts too created, the Tekton artifacts that you can uh, use to um, automate your build process. Mm, nice. I could put those right into my pipelines and be on my way. Absolutely. Cool. Great. Thanks, Ashok. This and, and Akash. This was really helpful to see how we could, uh, uh, you know, use Move to Cube to move our Spring Boot applications over. Um, let me go ahead sure. and uh, bring this back. So just to kind of reiterate where we're at. So we had um, we had just moved all of our uh, Spring Boot apps over to uh, Kubernetes now. So now I have my front end, my gateway, my order service and my customer service all running on Kubernetes. But 
I do have uh, a question here. Um, we, we, we kind of forgot about that database with, with the customer service. So how am I gonna move that over? Uh, Miguel, you had mentioned moving that over with Forklift. Is that something uh, we, can, we can talk through now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there are, as, as I said before, you may have, uh, like, like in this case, a database or some other workloads that uh, you would like to, to be able to move as they are into your Kubernetes environment. So um, let me share my screen and I'll show you. Yeah, yeah, um, I'm definitely, I, I get it. I'm, I'm really nervous to move that over, uh, you know, do anything to it because there's a lot of old PL SQL in there. We don't really know what's going on. So getting it over into Kubernetes first and then figuring that out would be a lot better. Yeah, so um, we have this tool for Clift that is going to bring uh, virtual machines from your environment, from your VMware environment into Kubernetes using KubeBird. KubeBird is a capability that helps you run VMs in, in pods, just like container in pods, but, but with VMs. So what we have here is that we have deployed Forklift and it has configured a provider that is KubeVert, as you could see here. So we have source and target. So this is going to be the target. We need to add the source. We can simply add the source by adding VMware. And what we're going to do is just provide the name, the, the IP address or, or host name, and uh, our credentials to access it. And, uh, and a fingerprint to ensure that we're connected to the right place and there's no money in the middle attacks. So right now we are adding this uh, target. You see that VMware tab has shown here. And what we have right now, source and, and target providers, you see. And mm -hmm. uh, it has loaded everything. We can see here the host. So we have been scanning your VMware environment uh, slightly to get all the data. And right now we are ready to, to perform a migration. So to do that, we do a migration plan and we create the plan and we give it a name. So we're going to focus on retail is what we are migrating right now from what you told me. So let's migrate retail. And uh, we select the source provider, in this case, vCenter and the target provider, which is automatically configured and set at host, which is your your Kubernetes environment, and we can select a namespace. I'm selecting here Global Retail, although we can create it from the menu, and go next. And then I have to select the VMs that we want to migrate. So I select this, this cluster, and then mm -hmm. it will gather all the information about the cluster. And I'll get here, you'll see all these VMs, and they are reviewed, so just in case they have something that will require some manual intervention. In this case, the name of the VM is not right, and we don't have change block tracking, so mm -hmm. we cannot do worm migration. Oh, well, that's really helpful. So, so it kind of guides you to tell you what to expect, right? Like you're gonna have to make some changes to the, the name here and you know you can't do a worm migration. Yeah. Okay, cool. Exactly, we don't want to have issues during the migration. We want to worm as early as possible. So here we have uh, um, the retail database that we want to migrate. And we have also some VMs like the business rules for for bacteriological warfare and the ESB doom for doomsday. So this this is this are for another day. Yeah, we'll right? ignore those for now. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we'll keep those out for now. So let's focus on the retail database. We click next, and now we have to establish an equivalence between the networks in the source and the networks in the target. So I'm going to create a map, an equivalence. So I'm going to use the VM network that the, the tool has uh, detected in the VM that is being consumed by by the network interface and I select the target network. So I use the pod network and I can save it to reuse it in the future. So I could save it as network map and go next. Same thing happens with the storage. We need to establish an equivalence between source and target storage. So it has detected that we are using an NFS data store in the source and I'm going to use a standard that is also NFS in the target. So they are equivalent. If you, have, if you happen to need um, faster storage in the source, you should select also and a storage class in the target that you have to have pre-configured in your environment first. So I could save it, click next. I am going to use call migration because we don't have change block tracking, but there's a chance to be able to do warm migration, which copies the data before shutting down the VM. Mm -hmm. And once the data is copied, we could shut down the VM, copy only the changes that were applied to the disk, reducing the time required as downtime and increasing the number of VMs that you could migrate in one intervention window. I like that. I Does like that sound that. like helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Less downtime is better. Yeah. So we have also hooks in case we want to automate changes. We're not automating changes in this case. So we just uh, complete and finish. 
and the plan is ready to start. So let's say that the intervention window arrives, we could click start and the migration will start uh, going on. So right now, um, the tool is connecting to the source, to VMware. It is using VDDK, which is what uh, the backup tools use to gather the data. So if it works for backups, it works for the tool. And we are transferring the disk. As you're a very busy man, I already transferred one VM. So let me show you, I'm using here OpenShift so we could show you in a new eye. And, um, and, but all the tasks that I've shown you could be done via API or CLI on Kubernetes. So mm -hmm. we are importing, and I have another VM already imported. So what I, I'm going to connect to this VM, okay? So I can connect to the console. And then, as you will see. Oh, nice to see um, my Oracle um, database running on, on Kubernetes. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is exactly right there. If I do not mistype it, so I'm, I'm going to, to become the Oracle user and I'm going to check for the connections, right? We have 200 connections and we need more. We need 250. So that's one thing we could do in Kubernetes that is very interesting. We have this deployment, sorry, this config maps, okay? Mm -hmm. And I created a config map that is very, very small and straightforward. And what it does is that it changes the number of connections for me. Oh, wow, okay. So, so all now I need to do... Yeah. So now, so now my developers can make changes to this VM just straight through Git. Right? Yes, exactly. Wow. So I just go to environment, associate this config map. I have added one service to the VM to pass the config map. And the only thing I need to do is to go and restart the VM mm. and the changes will, will be applied. Wow, that used to take us hours to get our, our DBAs to make changes and all that. So now you're saying it's just all pipeline based, right? It's all pipeline based. It could be used uh, as uh, another Kubernetes object. The same way you would do it for a container. So, oh, awesome. I mean, we could wait to check it, um, but um, the thing is that <laughs> once the VM is started, we'll see that the number of of the of uh, uh, I'll say connections uh, has increased to 250. So this way is how we can move uh, as many VMs as you want. Think that this tool is also intended to be able to migrate hundreds of, of VMs at, at once. Oh, that's so, great. Awesome. Thanks, Miguel. This was super cool to see how we can, you know, basically move this VM into more of a modern, uh, you know, modern, uh, you know, modern way of working. Right? How I can actually uh, use it with uh, config maps and change, make changes to it a lot easier. So, yeah. Cool. Let me uh, let me just see. So, just to kind of make sure I'm I'm on track here. So, we just moved that VM over that Oracle database. So now we have. The gateway orders and customer service, our front end, the Oracle database, everything running on Kubernetes, except for one last thing, Marco, which is my inventory service. So how how am I going to do this? Remember, this was kind of manually deployed, and I need to figure out how I'm going to redeploy this into uh, this new Kubernetes cluster, bring the state along, but also automate it with some kind of GitOps flow because you know I don't want to leave it the way it is. That's correct. And for that, we're going to use Crane. So just give me... Uh, one second, I'm just going to share my screen and I'll show you how Crane can help you with all that. Um, so, yeah, so the first thing we want to do, right, like this this was manually deployed in my inventory dash source namespace and, and now we want to be compliant with our production policies and have this automatically automated and, and, and following GitOps principles. So first thing I will do is to export the current manifest. So we'll, we'll use a command called Crane export to do that. And what Crane Export will do is uh, look at what's currently actually deployed in the inventory source uh, namespace, export all the, the manifests, and then uh, we can review those manifests and use another Crane command, which is called Crane Transform, to actually clean this up, remove everything that was uh, that is environment specific, and can do all kind of things to your uh, to your files so to to actually uh, or embrace even new technologies and things like that. So let me just wrong window first show you this new export folder now that has all your Kubernetes manifest in there okay and then I'll use the crane transform command which will look at those and will be stripping out like service cluster IPs and metadata information that is specific to this environment mm. So those are all the things that would trip me up when I'm trying to deploy into a new environment, right? Those are all specific. Exactly. And that's a common mistake that we see, right? People are just like deploying something on one Kubernetes cluster, but like if you really want to embrace hybrid cloud and be and or even promote 
your your apps from dev to QE to production. This needs to be automated, and and you don't want anything to be art coded in there. Mm -hmm. So we want that to be prog programmatically done instead of like art coded in your manifest. Uh, but to do that now, we created like a, a transform folder, which actually is all the things mm. we have detected that should not be art coded in your files. And we're creating JSON patches out of that so that this can be reviewed and analyzed to make sure, you know, we're, we're applying the right changes. And when we're ready, then we can use the crane apply command, which will look into all that, apply the patches, and then create all the files that you want to push to Git. So that this point, this can be fully automated using Argo CD to deploy your app on any cluster, and 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 can be done programmatically instead of uh, manually, as you're mm. deploying or promoting your application. So let's just run the crane apply command, and now if I go to my Git folder, I have a resource folder that got created, which is the brand new manifest now fully cleaned up and ready to go. So the last step I have to do is to push that to my Git repository. So then our CD can pick this up and, and provision my application automatically for me. So if I go back mm -hmm. to my main folder here, I have, oops, if I can type, I have an Argo file now, which is the definition, like it's a very simple Argo definition that will actually, with the, with the repository that I want to use to deploy this app and, and the namespace where I want this to be provisioned from, from this point on, as soon as Argo is actually taking care of that for me, then I can make changes and and push that to Git and and add this automatically deployed all the time just through the, Ar the Argo CD automated deployment model. Mm, but before great. I push that to before I get Argo to do all that, this is our inventory service and there's a lot of data as well, right? It's, it's, there's a database in there. There's a Postgres database with all your products. Yeah, we have so billions I, of products, billions. So it's good that we're moving a lot. We're moving your application, and then we can deploy automatically. But there's a question question of state, and the state is all the, the PVs, right? With all the data of your database that also needs to follow the deployment and be pushed from one environment to another. So we have another crane command for that that is called crane transfer PVC, mm. which use rsync in the background to actually copy the data, and this can be run multiple times. It will just copy the data from the last time I, I ran this command. But you guys have a very a big database with a lot of products, right? So I already ran that for you, so we don't have to wait for all those products or oh, database great, great. content yeah. to be updated, right? So we'll, we'll save that for another day. But yeah, uh, as you can see, in the, in, in the warehouses behind me, they're filled with products, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I already ran that for you. The, the, the database is already there. So actually now I'm ready to, to run this in Argo. So I'm just gonna run this uh, kubectl create with the Argo definition file. And this will launch Argo to actually provision my app. So let's look at, at Argo and see how, how actually Argo is provisioning all this. Uh, just give me one second here. So you'll see now that Argo actually looked at my brand new manifest that we have created with Crane that mm. is available on Git. And if I click on it, then you'll see like the full uh, deployment of my application uh, oh, and okay. attaching this to my TVs. Uh, with the database content. So Crane basically now, has transformed all, all my objects, and then you push that into Git, and now Argo's just taking over and redeploying it. And now I don't have to, yeah, now my, my, my deployment's basically automated, yeah? Yeah, and now you have following your GitHub's principles that should be actually the best practices way of deploying apps and promoting apps and, and embracing hybrid cloud as you can now deploy it on any cluster. And it would just follow along as everything is fully automated. So anytime you want to make a change, you make it on your Git repository, and then Argo would keep provisioning the latest changes for you automatically. Great, awesome. Thank you so much, Marco. That's a great, great demo. Uh, Showing me now. Now I believe. So this is basically the end state we've gotten to. So we've seen how we can now have all of our services running on Kubernetes, uh, leveraging a GitOps paradigm, and then simplifying our operations by running on a single Kubernetes platform. So this puts our retail application in a great uh, uh, place, right? Now we can start to plug in cloud services to this, start to bring in AI, ML, all the new cool things uh, that are available when you're running uh, your application natively on Kubernetes. So hopefully this demo by the, the, the conveyor group was helpful just to reiterate some of the tools you've seen across re-hosting, re-platforming, and ring factoring. You can see them here. In the future, we're gonna be bringing in Polaris as well, which will actually help us measure those Dora metrics uh, so that we could see the improvements we're making from a software delivery performance standpoint over time. Um, so if you're interested in joining us on this journey, uh, please join us at conveyor.io. Uh, this is where the community hangs out. We're interested in understanding how you're modernizing your apps 
and interested in building tools to rehost, replatform, and refactor your apps to run on Kubernetes and use other cloud native technologies. Um, you can find us on Conveyor Slack. Uh, you could learn about us by joining meetups. Um, and if you're interested in proposing a meetup talk, you can email us at conveyorio at gmail.com. So with that, um, I will go ahead and stop the recording and thanks for joining us.